100 years ago today, in this very hall, nurses from all over Massachusetts gathered to announce that they were taking control of their profession. Massachusetts already had a proud tradition of nursing. Civil War nurses like Louisa May Alcott, who wrote of the horrors she saw, and Clara Barton, who would go on to found the American Red Cross, both came from Massachusetts. The first true training school for nurses, the New England Hospital of Women and Children, was in Roxbury, where the Dimmock Community Health Center now stands. Linda Richards was its first graduate, making her the first trained nurse in the United States. She was soon followed by Mary Eliza Mahoney, the first African-American trained nurse. But by the dawn of the 20th century, the place of nursing in Massachusetts was still an uncertain one. The nurses who gathered at Faneuil Hall included Linda Richards and Mary Riddle of the Boston City Hospital School of Nursing with a goal to secure legislation to require state registration for trained nurses. Another participant, Mary E.P. Davis, expressed one of the goals of registration of nurses was the protection of the profession from counterfeiters, fakers, incompetents, and exploiters. There was no license to practice nursing at the time. There was no board of registration in nursing, quite frankly, until fairly recent decades. And uh, anyone could hang off the shingle or call themselves a nurse or anything else. So they had to define uh, the role. Mary Riddle was elected president of the organization and the official battle for the establishment of the profession of nursing was joined. The association charter would list its goals as to secure by legislation the protection of the nursing profession, to formulate a code of ethics, to secure uniform curriculum in nurses' education. Membership was limited to graduates of a recognized training school. In 1910, the first bill calling for the registration of nurses and establishing the Board of Registration was passed. Through a mixed board, the law provided a legal foothold for nurses. On November 15, 1910, Massachusetts Registered Nurse License No. 1 was issued to Mary Riddle, who would serve as chairperson of the Massachusetts Board of Registration and Nursing from 1910 through 1926. During this time, public health nursing was taking hold as a major force in the care and treatment of the poor and growing immigrant population centers of our cities. In African American communities, the proud black nurse carrying her satchel was often the primary source of health care. Throughout the early part of the century, hospitals used nursing schools as sources of cheap labor. This practice continued well into the century. In my day, we talked about the student nurse. In other words, you were doing nursing care, but you were a student. But now we talk about it as the nursing student, in which the student role is the primary role. And it happens to be that what you're studying is nursing. Do you see the difference? The vast majority of nurses worked in private homes for meager wages. These nurses gathered together in nursing clubs where they shared living quarters and expenses. In 1914, nurses would again answer the call of duty as the world went to war. The MNA participated in recruitment campaigns and public awareness campaigns to attract qualified candidates into the field with great results. In all, more than 21,000 nurses went to assist in the war effort. More than 1,500 nurses from the MNA served, a third of its membership at that time. In 1922, this Boston Globe article highlights the problem discussed at a meeting of the MNA about the problems of private duty nurses who were being replaced by lesser skilled, untrained nursing attendants. The UAPs of the early 20th century. As its first quarter century came to a close, the organization fulfilled the second of its mandates, the creation of a code of ethics. It covered the duties of the nurse to her patient, to the physician, to her profession, to the public, and to herself. By the end of its first quarter century, the MNA had grown to a membership of more than 4,000 in 1928. The call for an association had been answered. It now had a home, the legal underpinnings for its profession, a code of ethics, and the will to continue the fight for nursing autonomy. In October of 1929, the stock market crashes and the country heads into the Great Depression. This was a dark time for nurses. What happened then is that um, uh, hospitals are trying to take care of these nurses and they bring them back into the hospitals uh, and they get room and board in exchange for uh, service on the units. 
Fortunately, New Deal legislation led to improvements in nursing and changes in American health care. Unfortunately, the Hospital Association lobbied successfully for an exclusion in the Social Security Act that exempted hospital personnel, including nurses, from its compulsory old-age provisions and from unemployment compensation. As the 30s came to an end, the advent of a new world war would present a monumental challenge that was answered heroically by nurses and the MNA. During the war years, enrollment in the Army and Navy Nurse Corps soared, as did MNA membership, reaching a high of 9,780 members in 1942. More than 73,000 nurses answered the call to arms, and in each issue of the MNA Bulletin, a long list of member recruits was published, topping out at over 3,100 nurses who served in the war, more than 30 percent of the membership. One of those members was Frances Slanger, who was assigned to the 45th Field Hospital in Normandy following D-Day. Slanger awoke one night to pen a letter to the GI she had been dutifully caring for. It read in part, The GIs say we rough it, but in comparison to the way our men are taking it, we can't complain. But the men behind the guns, the men driving our tanks, flying our planes, sailing our ships, building our bridges, it's you that we doff our helmets. After taking care of some of your buddies, seeing them when they're brought in bloody, dirty, and most of them so tired. These soldiers stay with us but a short time, from 10 days to possibly two weeks. We have learned a great deal about our American soldier and the stuff he is made of. The wounded do not cry. Rough it? No. That's a privilege to be able to receive you, and it is a great distinction to see you open your eyes and, with that swell American grin, say, Hiya, babe. Later that day, her three tent mates signed it and sent it to Stars and Stripes, the Army newspaper. Hours later, an enemy shell burst beside their tent. Lieutenant Slanger became the first American Army nurse to die as a result of enemy action on the Western Front. Stars and Stripes received thousands of letters from GIs around the world. One read in part, Francis, our hats are off to you and all the other nurses. You and what you stand for are so inspirational to every man in uniform. There's not one of us who has not been inspired by your example of courage under fire. We're mighty proud of you. When the war ended, nurses came home changed in dramatic and fundamental ways. You have a grateful country um, funding education, uh, medical education, uh, nursing education, um, uh, building hospitals, um, um, bring up to speed nurses who had been out for a while. Um, and with all this education, you have the revolution. The third quarter century of the MNA will be dominated by nurses' intensified struggle for autonomy in their practice, respect for their profession, and fair compensation for their services. Collective bargaining will emerge as the vehicle for achieving all three, stimulating fierce debate and controversy within the organization. First and foremost, nursing has and always remains at the forefront in responding to the general health care concerns of the public, such as the early 1950s polio epidemic. Because this was an epidemic, uh, uh, not a, naturally not anticipated, uh, you suddenly have a great need for a large number of nurses to come in and give care. And I must say, they did volunteer. And I'm talking about the Boston area. This was I was in Boston at the time that nurses did volunteer to go into the hospitals that were particular the wards particularly set up for the polio victims. With the increasing availability of health insurance, the demand for hospital services grew dramatically. The federal government responded with expansion of nursing education funding and hospital building programs, supported by the GI Bill, which offered nurses the opportunity to continue their education. As always, keeping nursing an autonomous profession throughout this period continued to be a struggle. Hospitals were employing team nursing concepts, asking aides and technicians to expand their roles, and asking nurses to, in certain cases, assume the roles normally delegated to pharmacists. Nurses shared patients, and some one nurse did the medications, one nurse did the communicating with the physicians and the family, another nurse might have done the physical care of a patient. It was very disjointed and there was a lot of frustration and very little satisfaction. In response, both the MNA and the ANA called for and established the Professional Nursing Practice Committee. 
This body was charged with tracking, reporting on, and developing positions for the organization to deal with issues of the safe practice of nursing. Finally, in 1958, the legislature passed a new law that anyone practicing nursing in the Commonwealth must be registered through the Board of Registration in Nursing. Now, only a registered nurse or licensed practical nurse could practice nursing. The demand for nurses was growing as never before. A shortage loomed. With nursing salaries still woefully low, the stage was set for the development of collective bargaining. However, Massachusetts state law did not require hospitals to recognize collective bargaining rights for nurses. Between 1957 and 1959, eight bargaining units attempted to organize. All except one of the hospitals recognized the bargaining units, Hale Hospital, and none agreed to negotiate a contract. In 1964, after years of debate, the association filed and passed legislation that would extend coverage of the state labor relations laws to include health care facilities in their nurse employees. A hearing on the legislation was held at Gardner Auditorium. There were five of us who presented uh, different aspects of why uh, we felt uh, as an organized group of nurses we should have the right to collective bargaining. and. Um, this was favorably read out by the committee. They voted in favor of yes, they would support, they would recommend to the greater body of the legislature that this bill should go through. After that, um, there was most, the most intense period, I think, of a nurse lobbying the act became law in 1965, and shortly thereafter, Quincy City Hospital became the first MNA bargaining unit organized under the new law. By 1969, 76 hospitals were represented by the MNA. At Cambridge City Hospital, nurses staged a march and picketing outside City Hall when their talk stalled. The MNA negotiator was called in that night, and settlement was soon reached. In 1975, the state organized its workforce into different bargaining units, creating a health professionals unit, Unit 7. This would be a unique challenge for MNA and a milestone because for the first time, the MNA would represent professionals outside of nursing. The fight for a fair contract took years and was carried to the highest levels of state government. And what we did was we basically, uh, we basically flagged uh, Mike Dukakis every step of the way. Wherever he went in the state for his open public town meetings that he was fond of having, we would have four or five mental health workers from Unit 7, nurses and others, uh, standing up uh, in the audience asking him some real tough questions. And the tough questions being, you know, what was not being done for the direct care people, for the, direct, the, the, the patients, what they weren't receiving. While union organizing was taking hold at the MNA, another series of issues took center stage. Once again, America and nurses went to war, this one undeclared and much more controversial, but a number of members served, as had those before them. Throughout the 1960s and 1970s, as medicine and medical technology became more complex, nursing would follow suit, becoming more sophisticated and specialized. To assist nurses in preparing for this new world of nursing, the MNA stepped up its educational programming, holding regular clinical conferences with huge audiences. In 1973, Governor Sargent shocked the healthcare community with a proposal to do away with all boards of registration, including nursing. Thousands of nurses flooded the State House, City Hall Plaza, and Faneuil Hall. The bill was defeated. In 1975, the MNA had succeeded in passing legislation granting registered nurses to practice in expanded roles. In 1976, the MNA filed legislation to provide nurse midwives with the right to perform deliveries of babies. The bill passed two years later. This opened the door to legislation over the next decade that would grant prescription and treatment rights to nurse practitioners and psychiatric clinical nurse specialists, expanding and protecting the autonomy of nurses to serve the public. In 1977, the MNA succeeded finally in eliminating physicians and hospital administrators from the Nursing Registration Board and for the first time putting nursing solely in the hands of other nurses. As the MNA celebrated its 75th birthday, it was entering a new era of power, credibility, and change. Collective bargaining had gained a foothold and would soon find itself confronting decisions that would catapult the association and nurses into unknown territories of activism and personal risk.
In May of 1980, nurses at Newton Wellesley Hospital went on strike to force the hospital to recognize their union. This is the first nurses' strike in Massachusetts. Every time one nurse looked at the other 300 and the other 300 looked back, every one of us just stared into each other's faces, really, and said, this is really something. This is right. There was never a time when I didn't know that we would win, ever, not for one single second. Never. Over the next three years, nurses strike at Berkshire Medical Center, Cape Cod Hospital, Lynn Hospital, and Burbank Hospital in Fitchburg, the longest strike in MNA history. As hospitals continue to cut costs, nurses working with fewer support staff are forced to perform more non-nursing duties. In 1986, Kearney Hospital nurses respond with a 36-day strike that would ultimately limit non-nursing tasks. A total lack of respect. Yeah, I, I really think that's probably what pushed us into a strike was lack of respect for nurses, as well as being asked to do more and more non-nursing duties, you know, fill water pitches, empty waste baskets, answer telephones. I, it was empowering for nurses. Um, I think they found out who they were, what they could accomplish, um, and we definitely won that strike. In 1994, at a joint meeting of the MNA Cabinet for Labor Relations and the Board of Directors, the membership passes a resolution launching the MNA statewide campaign for safe care. Mandatory overtime was a key issue. The um, uh, number of patients an individual nurse would be required to take care of at any given moment. Is, is a major issue. And there's also the larger issue of the system itself uh, doesn't cover everybody and provide access to quality care to everybody in the system. So I think those are the major issues. Also in 1994, nurses at Brigham and Women's Hospital will begin a campaign to draw attention to the issue of poor air quality and workplace hazards that have already sickened hundreds in their facility. In 1993, Many of the nurses in different areas of the hospital, particularly the operating room, started to become sick. And we had very little understanding at that time about what the cause of their illness was. When I myself became sick in 1994, I was just very clear that nurses were facing a multitude of risks in their environment and that we as individual nurses needed to educate ourselves and to advocate for ourselves to make the workplace safer and that the Mass Nurses Association which represented us also had an obligation to really move quickly to start to advocate for nurses and for us collaboratively to um, protect nurses and start to understand the risks that they faced every day. In 1998, the MNA wins passage of whistleblower legislation, preventing employers from firing or reprimanding nurses who report unsafe conditions. I think nurses are not prepared to, for the real world of nursing, which is a world of policy and politics, big business and law. And by acting together and acting collectively, nurses have more resources, more knowledge and more power. At St. Vincent's in 2000, the issues are inadequate staffing and mandatory overtime. Mandatory overtime had never existed at St. Vincent Hospital before. It was very clear to us that the hospital fully intended to use mandatory overtime as a means of staffing the hospital rather than hiring the appropriate number of nurses uh, to staff the hospital. And they desperately wanted that in the contract that they would have the ability to use that mandatory overtime and we uh, had no intention of letting that happen. For many years, the MNA had struggled in vain to make the ANA more responsive and aggressive to the needs of frontline nurses. On March 24, 2001, members gather at Mechanics Hall in Worcester and vote for disaffiliation from the ANA. You know, we were obviously spending a lot of money um, and giving it to a national that was doing nothing giving us not back nothing in return as far as supporting the issues that we face every day. So it became a, you know, an issue that we had to make a decision um, to where we were going to go. And 
Uh, we felt very strongly that those that are out there taking care of the patients are the one other nurses that we need to um, support because they are the patient advocate. They're the ones that are out there day to day um, assuring that patients are safe or attempting to do that. And it was better to keep, a, if we were willing to have that battle, keep the money and the resources in the state and take on that battle. And I think it was the best decision we ever made. And I think we've done amazing things since um, we actually left the national. It was about power and control. The nurses of this state, the staff nurses, were the power. The MA is the largest healthcare union in the state. The nurses of the MA are 20,000 strong, and we are direct care bedside nurses. We, as staff nurses, were the power, but we didn't have the control. And we were finally mature enough and ready enough to say, hey, look, if we're the power, we want the control, let's go. Also in 2001, nurses at Brockton Hospital wage a 103-day strike over unsafe staffing and mandatory overtime. The leadership of the Massachusetts Nurses Association throughout time, as history has gone on, has shown us that it's okay for a nurse to stand up for her profession, stand up for her patients, and do the right thing. There are a lot of good people at Brockton Hospital. There are a lot of good nurses at Brockton Hospital. And there was no doubt that what we were doing was right. We knew that the fight that we were fighting was one that was going to be listened to and heard across the state and across this nation. Mandatory overtime was the key issue. The language that we were seeking was language that would protect us from making sure that the hospital did its job so that we as nurses could go and do our jobs the way we knew we wanted to do it. Even today, the struggle continues in places like Pembroke Hospital, where the administration refuses to recognize nurses' efforts to organize. We know, we absolutely know, because we did our own count, we know that it was a positive vote for the union. The minute we completed that vote, I believe it was May last year, they impounded the, the ballot. Now, the reason for that was they are still trying to quote Kentucky River. And they're still trying to say every nurse there is a supervisor. Every nurse there then cannot organize. They don't pay us as supervisors. They don't respect us as supervisors. There is a separate punch key to come into work as a supervisor. They don't respect us. They don't recognize us. How can they have it both ways? So they appeal to the National Labor Board in Washington where it has sat all this time. We've come a long way. We have the resources to do what needs to be done now, which we didn't have. We also have the unity of, uh, of vision around that plan now that we didn't have before. I really understood all along that nurses getting together and working collaboratively can accomplish amazing things. I became a nurse because I knew I could make a difference. I want to be allowed to make that difference. Is my dream shattered? Absolutely not. I am more oppositional and defiant of people who ask the wrong things than I ever was. And I will go to my grave being oppositional and defiant of that kind of behavior. I would think that the nurses um, that started this organization 100 years ago would be extremely proud of the nurses that are in this, in this organization today. Um, I would like to think they'd say, go girls, you, you're doing a great job in um, fighting for what we believed in 100 years ago and you're continuing that fight on behalf of everybody.